library a little bit, so we have a QR code. Where's Belushi? You have? Can you disable the video for a moment so they can see the QR code instead? No, we have it. It's on the microphone. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but it's better to get in the big screen. You mean it's set up so that if I'm, the camera is on, then the QR code is hidden? Yes, it's uh, so that we have the one one screen ah, that shows okay. yes. who is speaking, and then also the QR code when it's nobody is have, having a video on. Mm. All right, okay. so I think it's one o'clock now in here in Prague. So we will start. So this IP uh, maintenance and mining, uh, maintenance and extensions working group. I think it would be a minor extensions. I don't know. <clears throat> so this is the note well. I. I think you have already seen it a couple of times this week. And we need some note takers. Michael was promising to take something you know. And if anybody, there's an either party, if you can go there and, and, you know, especially if you make some comments and you are, you want to make sure that they, your comments are actually properly recorded, uh, you, you can go there and fix them yourself. That's make it, make it so, so that you are actually <coughs> saying what you are saying. Yeah, and also spell your name correctly then. Okay, so so we have <laughs> so we have a track agenda. Let's say let's go there. Okay, any comments on the agenda? Anybody wants to do any last minute bashing on the agenda? Oh, uh, but I'll be leaving at two. Yep. All right. All right, so let's go to the working group status report. So we have published the uh, labeled IPsec as a RFC 9478. Yeah, so now we need to add that number also. You're, 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 not, you're not mapping from the numbers to the names. I've been commenting this because I've been reading email RFCs and there are a completely new set of numbers that I have never ever heard about. So I have no idea what the documents are talking without you know going and finding all the RFC numbers. So we have one document in RFC editor queue, the add Ike. And then we have a one that is in publication requested out announce. Uh, we we still have the G Ike version two waiting for a couple of people to review it and comment it. And it has been waiting only I, I think that's more than 10 years. And then we have one document in working group last call, and we haven't received a single comment on that. So it doesn't look very good for people to actually working on that. If they don't read it and review it, it's probably not going to be go forward. Uh, multi essay performance. And then we have the working in process, uh, it's the SATS payloads. Opt. And then we have lots of adoption calls. Last time we had the, almost the same list here, uh, but then I was actually wanted to get Roman's comments about whether we actually they are part of the you know, our charter and so on. But he wasn't here, and he is not here either now. He's in PG, open PGP doing you know because uh, they are doing rechartering. So I will actually talk with him afterwards. But does anybody have any objections of starting or or do you think that all of these documents are something that we should be working on? So if there is no objections here to start a working group adoption call, then I will actually start the adoption calls after talking with AD. So probably like uh, next week or something like that. So does anybody have any objections of, do you think any of those that actually would need to have a more discussion on the list before we actually start working on? Was somebody saying something? Okay, Paul, go, go ahead. So I, I think, Christopher, I just see a thing pop up that, uh, oh, so never mind, that's a different room. Okay, um, sorry. Um, I just want, the way you phrase this is a little weird because you say, um, if you think we should work on this, let me know so we can start the working group adoption call. But of course, the adoption call is also if you think you don't want to work on. Yeah, this. no, no, no. I, I, I mean, if if you think that uh, these are completely outside of our start uh, charter and there is no interest of working those, uh, then we don't probably even want to. You know, then we probably want to have a more discussion before the adoption call. But, but, and I also, I actually want to get you know a little bit more. 
discussion on those uh, before we actually adopt them as a working group items because I think there's very few, there's a couple of those had some interest, but some of them are very, you know, uh, topics that people have very different ideas whether it actually should be solved or not. And so whether it's just an implementation issue or something that should be actually have a protocol change or something. All right. So let's go to the presentation then. I think the first one is Paul. Do you want to move your slides yourself or do you, do I just say next one? Okay. No, no, you, you, you do it. Um, so um, uh, with my implementer hat on, um, we ran into a few issues um, with the Diffie-Hellman group. And most specifically, the core, the core of the issue is that the initial exchange creates in IQ2, create, unlike IQ1, creates both a child essay and an Ike essay under one Diffie-Hellman group. And if you then have a configuration where you have a different value for your ESP Diffie-Hellman group versus your Ike Diffie-Hellman group, then you get like quite some inconsistent behavior depending on how you and for how an implementation enforces these different settings. Because um, in a way, um, you can actually make a configuration that is impossible to comply with, uh, but these configurations are being allowed by implementations and then end up being on the wire. Um, so one core problem is that um, also after you um, establish that initial ICANN and, and child essay, you don't actually know if the other end will want to do PFS on, on the rekey. That there's no trace in an, in the initial negotiation of doing that. So you don't actually know when, when two humans are, are configuring this connection, once it's up, they just assume it will work. But then at Riki, it could break because like one end insists on on, Diffie on uh, perfect forward secrecy and the other uh, end refuses it. Um, so uh, next slide. So if the negotiated IG DH is not valid for a child DH, then the respond has a few options. Like if, the, if there's no PFS, then there's no issue because there is actually no, no DH used. If there is PFS, then um, I guess you have to, you can return no proposal chosen, um, which is slightly better than invalid KE because invalid KE is really meant to signal you want to use a different Diffie-Hellman group of the list you received that are valid. Um, and then uh, if you do PFS is yes, then you, you kind of assume that the peer has the same child DH uh, value. Um, and then on the initiator, you've got similar, similar issues where you, um, you, you could decide if, you've, if your Ike is configured with, let's say, Diffie-Hellman 2 and your ESP is configured with Diffie-Hellman 14 only, you could say, like, this is a bad configuration. I refuse to load it. Um, you could also do other um, strange things. So we did some brainstorming about should we just send an information or delete? Should we do something else? Um, more on that on the following slides. The next slide. Uh, and then we don't only have to. So, so the, the, the issue starts at the initial exchange, but actually sort of not really happens at the rekey of the initial child. And there's also issues if you have multiple child essays and one comes in with the ICA saying you add a second one later on and in, the, in your configuration that is the, the same Diffie Hellman groups. Um, so anyway, so so um, you, you, uh, it, it shows a, a few options that you, if you can do. One suggestion is that we have a like a, 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 a new payload that would sort of say like unexpected DHKE or something else to 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 sort of more um, more show this error code. Um, but, to, but to show you a bit of the problem, um, uh, next slide. Um, oh, sorry, these are the. Uh, so apart from the problem I, I explained, there's additional complications. One is that um, at least all the versions of Microsoft would um, probably do something like Diffie-Hellman 14 for ICASA and then a lower Diffie-Hellman value. And I think it was actually DH2 or DH5 um, for the child. And then so you actually had this at rekey, it would like, you know, do weird things with the Diffie-Hellman group. So, so we actually, as an implementer, we added an option to sort of accept that because we couldn't reach people inside Microsoft. Um, Additionally, um, this problem also comes up again in the, um, the draft SAPS payloads, where we're doing like this, opto this um, uh, rekey with this exactly the same parameter. So we, for PFS, we only send a new KE group and nothing else. But again, that, that also has the same uh, problem of not knowing this information because it didn't become obvious from the initial uh, exchanges. Additionally, there's a problem of uh, some implementations um, 
in, uh, want to see the DH non-value in the transforms, and while others actually will die if you if you put that in. So you have to juggle about whether you can put in that DH none or not, um, which is also not really nice. So next slide. And um, so at some point, so 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 Libreson had an implementation mistake where after we negotiated the ICSA and it, and the ICSA had potential different parameters on the rekey. Um, for the ESP would actually send uh, uh, all the um, all the initiated, oh, sorry, all the uh, all the configured groups instead of continuing with the initiated group. So you could actually switch the ESP value midway through because of this. So we fixed that, and then we ran into other issues. So this is a matrix of all the options um, where we needed to to figure out what to do and how the behavior changed. And then we realized like this is a much bigger issue. We should just clarify this in the, in the document somewhere. So next slide. Um, so uh, one option is to disallow having a different helm, different, uh, different Diffie Hellman group for the Ike and the child essays because like an Ike V2, there really is not a clear distinction anymore. Um, for people who've been here for a while, you might vaguely remember that I already tried to do that in RFC 8247 and people didn't like that. So I'm assuming that's still the case. Um, there are some other solutions out there, but really what it comes down to is that I think the best solution we've sort of come up with in the, in the hallways is that um, if you just add the Diffie-Hellman group of the ICSA you negotiated to the child essay proposals, um, then at least on the, on the, on the rekey, you ensure that you at least have you know, a possibility of negotiating the same group. You might negotiate like a stronger group, um, but at least you got you don't have a degrade in security because you already use this group for the, for the child essay that's under the ICSA, so you already have you know, a potentially weaker group. So you might you might have like not gotten what you wanted because of your configuration, but then that's your own implementation fault. It's not like a negotiation error. Um, so next slide. It's basically um, one, would we like, do we see use in having a notify that would actually in the, in the initial exchange would sort of already advertise the KE of the child that, that you're willing to accept? Uh, and do people think that adding the Ike, uh, the Ike Diffie Hellman group to the ESP negotiation uh, would make sense? Michael. So it seems like the origin of this problem is that the initial exchange succeeded. Correct. And, and that if it would consistently fail, then people would go, oh, I misconfigured. Correct. And would pick a configuration one or the other. So it seems like something that goes to that direction without breaking everything would be the best direction to go, be most consistent. Right. So, so that's But I don't know what of the choices you've given is the, right. the best way to get there. So for instance, that, that first option where you just advertise the, the Diffie Hellman group that you will use later on during your rekey would be useful. But of course, that requires everybody updates before they support it. So it doesn't remove because the Because you can't problem. just ignore that. It would be no, no proposal chosen. Well, if you ignore it in the future, you will get no proposal chosen. But then at least you have all the decisions to immediately fail your connection when you start up. So the human is still at the keyboard testing this connection and sees the failure. Then I think that's the best idea. Yeah so, yeah, so that fixes the problem for the future, but it doesn't fix the current problem where nobody has this feature. And doing the... So, so, so if I put that in, I would get a no proposal chosen because the other end didn't understand that no, option. I, no, no, no. If you put the notify in, then you would realize that this problem is there. If okay. you're talking to a new implementation, but those Cisco's from 10 years ago that haven't been updated, you know, are still doing this old behavior. So it doesn't help you for all the yes, existing yes, things out there. Yes, you want to if it's going to break, you want to you want to do something that breaks it immediately for yes. new implementations break immediately and um, and then they recognize that there's a configuration right. error. Right, and then yeah. for the old implementations, if we allow the KE group of the ICA safe also for the ESP the Fialman group, then you know you've already negotiated under that group, so you're already running with that protection. So like on the rekey, it's kind of keeping the same protection, even if your configuration wasn't meant to use that one, but you already committed to, to breaking your own configuration when you negotiated the ICSA for that so, child. So it, so it sounds like we should do both those things. Okay, great. Yeah. So. Thank you, Nasser, individual. So I think the 
proper solution is to say that your ESP, if you think about it, Ike, the Diffie Hellman in Ike, that's usually the most important one. Because you are, you are, you are quite often child essays, you know, the PFS in child is, is you can use in, you know, lower because it's usually shorter time period. You might be rigging every hour and you don't need to do, you know, uh, eight kilobit, uh, you know, group for protecting that. You can use a shorter one. But so, so, so I think we should be thinking about it, that allowing the same group that you do in Ike, which is probably stronger than in a PFS. I, I don't see really reason why you, but PFS group would be a stronger than the Ike group. So, so allowing the same group always to be used in ESP and Ike for, for so ESP would always allow the same group that in Ike would be the easy solution because that would actually solve the problem for old implementation. So to refuse the configuration, if the configuration doesn't allow, if your ESP says group five uh, only, and the Ike says, uh, you know, 14, that would refuse the configuration. You have to configure ESP to use both five and 14 to right. be able to use Ike, Ike, Ike 14. Yeah, that, so, so we, we don't say that anywhere, but like if we're doing a document, we could say that. Yeah, that, 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 would, be, that would be something that would be very useful. About it. And then there's the, the, you know, the other thing is that if you really, really want to make sure that you are, you are not doing 14 in, in, in the child essay, then you can always use this uh, uh, you know, childless negotiation with you do the Ike essay without the child. Yes. So and, and and then you create the create child essay as a separate. That that happens also for non-first essays anyway. So you can do that. So that would actually be analoging that. Case. Yes, but but there are a number of implementations that don't support childless essay. Yeah. Uh, so, so, so so so. But that's as, still a, as, a, as a method <laughs> as a method of of doing this fix, you would actually be breaking things. So it would yeah, no, no. But the, the, the thing is that if you if you try to do childless essay, and the other end doesn't support, you immediately get an error which is something that you wanted to have, then you could actually say, okay, so you don't support the childish uh, essay. So that's why we have to do this other thing. Okay, that's fair, that's fair. Daniel? Um, considering that we also have the document about um, additional key exchanges for PQC matters, um, where also there's key, like additional key exchanges or CAMs taking place after uh, IGOTH. I'm not quite, not quite sure if there's any impl implications for one or another, but we should keep this in mind when uh, drafting a, the solution for this one. That's a good point, yes, exactly. Thank you. I'll state the obvious that a new notify talking can you, sorry, about- Sorry, can you speak a little more okay. to Mike? Uh, I'll state the obvious in saying that having a, known, a new notify to actually be explicit about our PFS policy telling it to the peer is, is the obviously the right thing to do. Uh, the other issue I can see is PFS is not actually mandatory. So uh, I don't see how you could take the, uh, solve, the case, uh, solve the existing case of one side doesn't want to do PFS, the other side does. So um, I know at least one implementation that uh, used to be very open-minded about PFS. Mm -hmm. If he said PFS is no on the other and did it, then they're like, great, let's do PFS then. That's always yeah. better. Yeah. But that actually ended up in reverse interrupt our issues. If the rekeying mm -hmm. part changed who it was, then the, the yeah. proposal would mm -hmm. change and would fail anyway. Yeah. So there are implementations now uh, that will fail if the PFS is mismatching, regardless of what yes. the RFC says. Yes, and yeah. <laughs> and and we are part of the problem and we try to be better than the RFC and we still are part of the problem uh, uh, and I want to say uh, hello I want to say that probably um, you should make a distinction between two cases uh, Ricky and the great creation of additional child essays between because for additional child essays um, you can very often not do PFS. Uh, consider a situation when you create Ike essay and then you need to create, I think, dozens of additional child essay for some, because of some policy. There is no point to use PFS in this case because uh, the initial entropy that you get from Ike essay is sufficient. Uh, very short time passed since you created Ike essay. Uh, but when you do a rookie uh, of any, say, if I could say it's always for child essay, 
uh, it's it's make a good point to add an additional entropy uh, just because a lifetime of uh, essays several hours uh, you need to add an entropy. Then, so these two cases uh, probably should be treated differently. And uh, one more point, just Paul. So, sorry, um, perhaps. Um, some implementations may have a more flexible rekeying policy when they, for example, uh, rekey uh, with no PFS and with PFS uh, interleave these um, um, two cases for, for, for the sake of performance. For example, after a few hours, you just rekey just without PFS, just to get uh, to, to update session keys, and then you key with PFS the same thing. So this may be considered too. So the situation may be a bit complex. So I actually thank you. That's actually a very good point I had a thought about. So to, uh, I'll, I'll try to rephrase at least the first part in my own words. You're saying, well, I am thinking in connections have PFS is yes or no. You're saying, no, no, connections actually have PFS is yes or no, depending on the situation, and it's yes, not a static yes, yes. configuration. That's a very good point that I had actually never thought about, which we definitely do not support in our implementation, and we should. Um, thank you. Yeah, that was very useful. Um, so I, I, I feel that there's at least enough interest to scribble up something and, and talk to a few people and do an initial zero zero draft and see what we'll do from there on. Yeah, there, there seems to be interest in the group, and I think uh, regardless if we modify the, you know, which options we take, we, having some kind of document that actually lists all the, you know, features or all of the, you know, issues that come up with this would be very useful. And depending if we do, you know, any a protocol modification, we could actually make an informational, you know, this is how you should be, you know, implementation guidance thing that if you are really, you know, want to have a PFS, please do this way to, so you actually work with everybody else. But, but if you would like to add as notify, that would be more of that, a standard that would be, that would, that would be more of a standard track. But that, that's why I'm saying just so we can actually do either way, depending on what, what our discussions go in the... In the okay, well, let, let, let's first get some text together. Yeah, see where it goes. first we need to actually put the issues in the draft format and, you know, do this kind of thing. All right, so... I think that's for that. So let's move to the next one. Next presentation is Valerie. Uh, so uh, this is just an update about the uh, draft or about alternative uh, alternative approach for mixing PPKs in IP2. And next, please. So just a quick recap. Uh, if you know, we have uh, RFC 8784 that uh, allows to mix an additional uh, symmetric key into the Ike key scheduler. Uh, so this key is called PPK, but due to design, design it is only used, it is not used in the initial Ike state. It doesn't protect initial Ike state. It only protects, protects initial child essay or Ike essay after the first tricky. So the next please. And uh, it was proposed an alternative approach using uh, Ike intermediate exchange uh, that allows uh, the initial like I say to be fully protected with PPK. And uh, next, please. This is just uh, a comparison between these two approaches. So uh, the green is an alternative. In green is uh, alternative approach, and uh, uh, we have. An advantage that initial like I say is protected, but disadvantage that uh, additional round trip is needed. But uh, we save one computation of oath per load if uh, PPK is optional, and the initiator can propose several PPKs ID. And next, please. So, what's new? Just a new version was published recently, and it has some important updates based on the feedback uh, received in the mailing list. And negotiation of alternative approach is now explicit and independent from uh, 7.84. Uh, so this is just uh, results in a more clear protocol and uh, more clear distinction between 87, 84 in this approach, because an initiator may suggest, may propose to use both. 
it is uh, triggered by different um, notifies and the respondent just must select one of them. It's clear. And uh, the most important, uh, the more important update is that uh, now a uh, use of PPKs in create child DSA is defined. So my thought was, uh, I was thinking about using um, shared keys that were uh, distributed by quantum key distribution by cookie d so uh, the rfc 8784 assumes that ppk is relatively static so it's uh, its lifetime is longer than lifetime of uh, i can say so it's it, that's one that's why it is used once and uh, if it is changed we just delete an IKSA, create it from scratch. But if we if PPKs are changed more frequently, for example, as a result of QKD, when they can be changed every minute or all the like, so there is no point to delete IKSA and to create it from scratch. We just want to use a new entropy from new PPK in uh, subsequent like messages. So the natural the natural way to do it is just to mix PPK and create LDSA in the create LDSA exchange. So this draft defines a way how to do it. Next, please. So it's very straightforward. Just uh, add and unify PPK identity key into the create LDSA uh, and the responder selects which PPK identity to use. And the next, please. The uh, keys are calculated uh, also very straightforward. Uh, just SKD is mixed with PPK as a key uh, using PRF plus, and uh, the new key is used instead. The new, the resultant key is used instead of uh, initial key, initial SKD. So that's all. Next, please. Uh, so thank you very much and for attention. And this draft was already in the adoption list uh, before, but Tara asked me to first make a presentation and then ask about a possible adoption. And as far as I remember, there was some support on the mailing list for adoption, the previous version of this draft. So I am asking now whether it is still an interest in the working group for adoption of this draft. All right, any comments on that? No. Paul, go on. So just a quick comment. Um, we have implemented previous versions of this draft and we are going to implement the latest version as well. So we are interested in adoption. We use in Libras one. All right. I don't see any other comments, so we are going fast now. And I will this is probably this is something that is uh, I have seen some more interest in in in, in list and so on. So I, I will actually make a adoption call that that's how actually this was in the separate group because it was we had presentation here and we are talking about you know. Uh, so I will probably submit an adoption call for this very soon. All right. So next one, we have Stefan. Do you want to try those slides yourself? Oh, okay, you just check. Yeah. yeah, hi, I'm talking about the ESP problem statement draft we published. Next slide. You probably need to go closer to the mic. Yeah, so ESP has a couple of problems in today's networks. We identified two root causes, and one is, of course, replay protection. I mean, there were already a lot of proposals to fix those, and I was talking about that at the last meeting. The other thing is the header and the trailer format as ASP has it today. That might not fit to all use cases today anymore and that's what I'm going to talk today. Next slide. Uh, okay, next. Yeah, what are the prob problematic scenarios? One thing is high-speed networks. Here's the problem that the header and the trailer may end up in different cache lines, what could cause performance penalties if your link speed is very high. And the other thing is our four byte alignment for the ESP payload is way too short for modern instructions. The next thing is software defined networking. They want to see inner transport header to handle that, but they're of course encrypted and well, it 
cannot be seen. So next slide. So what are the possible solutions? First about the high-speed networks. So we could move the header to the trailer to fix the cache line problems. And we could um, uh, enlarge the alignment somehow to make Smitten or AVX instructions work. Next slide. So what are the advantages to move the trailer? Of course, our main software packet processing would benefit from cache locality. And the parsing would be much simpler because you don't have this very little payload in between. And so you exactly know where your header and trailer fields are. Disadvantage is, of course, that it's a larger change to the packet layout that had to do them. Okay, next. So the other thing is the alignment requirements. So advantages would be, of course, that uh, modern instructions operate much faster. But the disadvantage is if you align um, the payload, the trailer, the trailer still might not be aligned because you have this uh, payload in between which you don't need, know the pack the size of. So the packet would require even more padding to align the trailer to. So we think that might be useful if the trailer is going to be removed, but otherwise we would not consider this as a change. Next. So what about SDN? So in SDN, they want to see the inner transport header. And I think there are two possibilities. First one is to use an encryption offset saying just um, let's show N bit at the beginning of the inner header that um, the transport header can be parsed or you just swap ESP and transport header. I don't think it's any other option possible. So next slide. So what about encryption offset? Advantages is that it's easy, it would enable the use cases and it is optional. You can just leave it zero and this means it's encrypting everything and it's up to you to choose how many bytes you want to show inside the packet. This advantage here is of course um, that um, intermediate devices need to implement this version of ESP to parse the header to see how that is going. So, I mean, Google PSP uses that approach and it might be a way to go for us too. So next slide. So the other thing is to swap ESP and transport header. Um, that would be transparent for intermediate devices, but it would look a bit strange and it's probably a layer violation. So we would not recommend that, <laughs> even though it's technically possible. Next slide. So which way to solve the problems? So first thing is you could adjust the ESP protocol, you could define a new protocol, that's always possible, or we might be able to reuse the West protocol to get what we want. We haven't considered that in the draft, but I'm just showing it for completeness here. So next slide. So what about adjusting the ESP protocol? That would work pretty well for a sequence number problems because you just um, interpret some header fields differently. There's no change to header and trailer and that would work quite well for that case. But problematic would be um, if you want to change header and trailer format because you don't have a new protocol number. So you need to negotiate all these new versions somehow and it's not transparent to middle boxes. So it would not enable the SCN case. Next. So defining a new protocol would probably solve all of the problems. Maybe we could use Google PSP as a starting point and look how it goes. I mean, it's of course the most invasive change, but on the other hand, it's also sort of the most flexible change. So um, if we want to have a modern encryption protocol that meets all the use cases in today's network, that's probably the way to go. Next. Okay, another possibility that might work is changing the REP PSP <laughs> protocol. That would also cover all cases. West is not widely used, but of course, changing that would be a bit of abuse of the original <laughs> protocol. The protocol has a version number field. You can just bump, the, bump this field and change um, header and trailer as you want to have it. But as I said, I think that's, it's an option, but it's probably not the best one. So next slide. Okay, that's what I have. I'm taking questions, suggestions, and ask for adoption. Thank you. Paul. So, so I'll start. So um, it's been a long time since I skimmed the Google PSV document. So can you tell me maybe one or two lines, what is the difference between the suggested ESP changes by moving the trailer into the header and the variable length offset and PSP? 
the PSP protocol keeps the trailer, but he, the protocol has, has an offset for uh, encryption and it moves um, the next header field out of the trailer into the header. And it has a virtual network identifier field that is optional. It's just a starting point. You can look at this. I mean, the Google people are interested to come to the IETF and discuss about that. They're open to changes to that protocol. So it might be a starting point and we can have a look and adjust it to our needs to get an standard. Uh, the Rocky Vinayasa individual. So I think actually rapid ESP was actually meant to be used for this kind of purposes. And, you know, modifying it to actually expand, for example, we could, we could make it so that we could, we could <clears throat> modify it so that we actually take some of the PCs from inner header, transport header, move it out to the rapid ESP header. There's some stuff between the rapid ESP header and the ESP header. Mm -hmm. We could copy things that are needed for the middle boxes there as a copy. One of the good ideas, one of the you know things that Rapid ESP allows, it allows you to do this uh, without modifying ESP because the ESP bucket is there. Right. You just add the Rapid ESP header. You copy some stuff out from, you could actually copy like the source and destination addresses out from the inner head. You, you would have an extra copy of that, but we are talking about high speed links where probably, you know, this kind of copying wouldn't yeah. matter that much. And also you could probably solve some of the alignment problems also by, you know, just adding suitable amount of padding to make sure that the ESP header, you know, padding is, is correct, whatever you like. One of the problem with the padding thing is the padding changes every single generation of the CPU. Right. So, so, so today we need 32 bytes or, or 64 byte car. Well, next, next, next week we might meet, meet, meet 256 byte, you know, alignment. So trying to, you know, optimize it for certain, you know, use cases is not really that useful. And uh, also moving stuff to the end also has the property that you can't actually do some of the parsing in the, uh, in the line speeds really. There's, there's, I know that there's have been at least actually implementations who actually start processing packet before it actually finishes coming from the link. So when they see the SPI, they might actually start, you know, routing it before it actually got, got to the end of the bucket. And if you have a jumbo cramp that is really big, that actually might be a big difference. Yeah. I mean, we, we had a test, we tried that to move the header to the trailer and we could see that we get performance improvements with that. Uh, regarding West, yeah, I mentioned this because I noticed we don't need to change ESP for that, but I wasn't sure if the working group would like to Abuse, misuse, change that protocol for that purpose? I, I don't think it's a, a misuse. <laughs> I think it's, it's used for as intended. It, it's first intended to be <coughs> extensions uh, that are okay. that doesn't modify the basic ESP, but modifies something. Yeah. I would be fine looking at this. Yeah. And regarding um, the alignment, I mean, that's sure. I mean, alignment changes, but maybe so every 20, 30 years, we could maybe adjust things. <laughs> <laughs> to neural networks, so. So um, one comment, uh, so Daniel Migo. Um, I'm wondering if we want to, uh, to have an offset, um, maybe we could also create um, a new, new IPv6 extension, which is the un unencrypted beginning of the packet. Um, so just as a way to do, but that might be an, an hor a horrible hack. Um, then, Sorry? That's what Rapid ESP does. Partly. Yeah, partly. Yeah, it says Michael of the school ending there that mm -hmm. that's what Rapid ESP does. It's basically adds a new header there in the beginning of the, before the ESP header. Yeah. It, it's part of the ESP still actually, but, but it has a separate protocol number. But then it would be outside the ESP. Yes. Um, but the other question is um, whether we should hack uh, WESP or not. I think it's probably better because at the time we published uh, WESP, we really promised that's the very last code point we're going to ask. Yeah, we promised. So maybe that would save a lot of time just reusing that uh, protocol. <laughs> Hannes, um, listening to the discussion, I'm wondering whether your question that you originally asked in your presentation, uh, people are already 
beyond that and, and really debate deep into like how could we solve it uh, and so i think the question here is like do we do we want to work on that problem as the problem statement clear type of thing um right um the other thing like a small note um the i think you you were referring to the single instruction multiple data instructions mm -hmm. uh, simd um, it's a glitch over there. You didn't expand it, so I wasn't quite sure. But uh, it's yeah. some other some other thing that I didn't uh, recognize. But uh, might be worthwhile uh, to look into the details. I don't know if you uh, wrote it down in the document on, on um, how much benefits or how much performance improvements you will actually get out of this. I would be curious, uh, interested mm -hmm. in that. Mm -hmm. I, I don't think the instruction length will change. Uh, like uh, every few months, um, I wouldn't go that far. You know, stuff lives longer than we would think. Uh, so, uh, 32 bit, 64 bit is is uh, is a pretty good, uh, pretty good bet. And specifically, the SIMD instructions are mostly used on 64 bit processors. So. Um, Wei Pan from Huawei, uh, thank you very much for this topic and uh, uh, for the high speed link. Uh, actually, we have same feeling about the challenges of this need, uh, uh, of this need and uh, uh, but uh, I will I have a topic later to describe that and uh, I think there uh, our problem st statement is a little different from yours and uh, maybe we can uh, add to your uh, to your draft or something yeah thank you okay sure yeah but I mean whatever we do I mean we should uh, care for the Google guys. I talk to them. Them, they're interested to come. And I mean, so part of the implementing community started already in that direction. So we would, we should at least need to think about it. Hi, Dan Harkins. Can you go to slide nine, please? Oh, this is uh, slide nine. Uh, this is nine. Yes. Uh, so I, I want to understand this a little bit better. I think. I mean, one of the disadvantages would be that doesn't encrypt everything. You know, I, I, this sounds like a, a, a really bad idea to me. Uh, TLS spent, you know, several ITFs telling people that wanted to look into TLS 1.3 1 packets to, to pound sand. Mm -hmm. So I'd, I'd like to know what, what it, do these people want to, how far do they want to look into the packet and what uh, do they want I, to see? I think they just want to see a transport header, not a payload. The whole transport header. I, I think so, yes. Ooh, yeah, I, I, yeah, but I but but it's it's up to you what you want to show. So well, yeah, but giving an option to like yeah. encrypt portions means yeah. someone's going to end up having ESP that encrypts. Basically, we're going to end up with null ESP with some yeah, you know, it's, misconfigured. It, it's basically one of the options. Either you show a little bit be behind the ESP header, or you swap it out and okay. put it in front. I, I you have exactly bad, these two options. Bad, yeah. Sorry, let me, let me just re reply that. So, so often people run like IP, IP tunnels or something, and then the transport header is actually just like one port and all the traffic goes over one port anyway. So you're actually not leaking any, anything. I mean, there's use cases where you don't leak anything. There's obviously use yes. cases with end user where you leak everything and you should not do this. Yes. Michael, I think you are in the queue. Michael Richardson. Um, so. Original question I had for Stefan is, um, have you done any um, point prototype uh, implementations specifically on, you said some trailer stuff you've done and that yes. was- so my, my co-author tried that and there is an academic paper about that where they show the results. It's referenced uh, in the draft. So you okay, awesome. That. So so that, that I think is actually right. That I think is the most important part of it. I find it bizarre, but to Dan's point, I found it bizarre that the SDN part was was mixed in. Um, uh, my opinion is that, except in the strange cases that Paul mentioned, that um, this is, I think, mostly laziness on the SDN side of things. Um, we got requests before whatever we called it, WESP, right, which no one's ever used, I think, um, uh, we got requests, you know, please show us the headers back in like 2003. And I would ask them, okay, what's the benefit, right? What are you going to do for me if I show you my headers? Oh, it's wonderful. We have all these wonderful things we can do for you. Like what? Crickets, right? It was just silence. It's like, okay, 
if we're going to take that risk of showing port numbers or whatever it is that's happening or whatever, what's, what's the value? Articulate that clearly because what came out was that in this case, it was performance enhancing proxies in, in 2G networks that actually were compensating for buffer bloat. So actually you could have solved the problem by just dropping packets earlier. All of their performance enhancing was solvable by just doing, doing your, your congestion control properly. And, and that's repeatedly been the case is that we get network operators who think they have a problem and that encryption's getting in their way. And all of the peer-to-peer -peer networking disaster of you know 2010, all due to buffer bloat, all solvable with buffer bloat mitigation and had nothing to do, you never needed to look deeper and inspect and pack it. But now those networks have you know deeply expensive DPI that does nothing except break their network, yeah, right? right? Right. I so, mean, that they're just there are people who regressed that, and actually Google implemented it in their protocols. So th there seems to be a need for it, but it doesn't mean it's there. You know, yeah. that doesn't mean they have they learned from history because they're sure. too young to do that. Aren't I mean, they, we, right? <laughs> so, we, 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 anyway, that, that's my one. I, I, we don't need to do it. I mean, this is all right. right. We don't need to do this. If we're going to do this, we need to have that case well articulated, and sure. that's the yes. only thing I've said articulate the benefit clearly so that we know why we're doing it. And we, if it's expensive for us to do, because it is, uh, whether we copy or make our FPGAs more complicated or whatever, it's expensive. So there better be an ROI on that part. And if, and if the ROI is, you know, solved by increasing the network bandwidth speed by 10%, then that might actually be the better choice, right? So thanks. But I'm all for the okay. I'm all for the moving the bytes around. Uh, my first IETF that was proposed that we would move the IPv6 source and destination swap them for cash line reasons. And Christian Huitema says that's great for me. Everyone will have to buy a new book. Um, and uh, at the end of the meeting, they decided not to do that. So, uh, Scott Fleur, Cisco Systems. I would basically reiterate reiterate what Dan and uh, Michael just said. Uh, if we want to give the uh, system administrator a, a, a potential pistol, a hand cannon to shoot themselves in the foot, we really need to, really, really need to think about if that's what we really need to do. Yeah, okay. Maybe we need to investigate a little mm -hmm. bit more on that. Right, yeah. Um, yeah, so two comments. Um, the first one, I think we had a similar... We had a use case with uh, the user of channels, uh, Geneve channels, and we came with something where we need to have the offset, but I don't remember exactly why. Um, so that might help for that use case as well. Um, the other thing is that I see the discussion very lively on those topics, and we have been um, discussing that for a few years. So I think it would be really helpful if we have the draft adopted so we can have a I mean, the working group can actually take a, a directions and um, pe people get involved into that. So I'm really in favor of the adoption of the draft so, so that the working group can discuss and take a decision. All right, so that's it. I think that's the end of the queue. Okay. So we will continue discussion on that in the list, I guess. So, next presentation is on the replay sequence number subspaces. Pierre, that's for hey. smart. Yes, okay. Okay, hi everyone, I'm Pierre. And this is the, the update for the third iteration of the entire replay subspaces draft. Uh, so first, next slide, please. Um, quick recap, if uh, some of you haven't been uh, reading the draft yet. Um, you've seen there is a lot of activity in the working group around the, uh, the issues uh, with entire replay, uh, mostly in two scenarios, multi-core, so when you need multiple cores to use the same SA, the same child SA, and in the case of multipath, because uh, packet reordering causes entire replay issues. Uh, this has been very well documented in the, in the multi-sequence counters draft and presented by Stefan uh, last ITF. So uh, you can have a look at the recording if you need more uh, information about what's going on. Uh, and there has been solutions as well discussed, like the multi-SA performance, which basically uh, suggests to 
have multiple essays, uh, negotiate multiple essays, and this draft proposes a fairly decent solution to that. And, you know, no, nothing against it, but the problem and the reason why we are publishing this other draft is because this first solution doesn't work in our context because it would end up um, uh, negotiating a, a ton of essays. Uh, I'll get more into numbers in a later slide, but you know, for now, um, just bear in mind that this would increase the number of keys that we have to do uh, to support. This would increase a lot the number of Ike messages that we have to send. Uh, and you know, pointing out as well that Ike v2 was originally designed to reduce the number of messages because of the traffic selector issues. Uh, also, the more uh, child essays you have, the more PFS becomes costly uh, whenever it's enabled. So uh, our solution is in a, in a very brief summary. Uh, we are suggesting to uh, make the 64 bits and replay sequence number explicit in the ESP header, so instead of just 32 bits, and use um, just a few bits of them, the first, uh, the header bits, as a subspace ID. This way, we, we keep the sequence number unique. Uh, they, they, they remain unique. Uh, but we have multiple counters so that we can s use different uh, enter replay counters for different cores, for different paths. And this uh, shows some really strong benefit for us in our case. Um, we have a, a single essay. Uh, we have a single RTT to establish this uh, child essay. Um, and we have a, a lot of clarity around, okay, is the subspace negotiation successful or not? Uh, and we don't end up with having you know, uh, a lot of messages uh, to exchange. Uh, also, to us, it feels like a better approach to solving the problem because we believe this is an entire replay issue because entire replay was not designed with that in mind. And we are trying to uh, fix that at the level of entire replay and not uh, by modifying Ike, which is uh, another, another layer. Um, also, you know, we don't, since we are not modifying Ike too much, um, it makes I think the implementation is somewhat easier. So it, it does require a change to ESP, uh, but the, the, the change seems a little bit uh, cleaner. Uh, so getting to that in the Ike changes in the next slide. Um, so the only, that, that's most of the changes since last um, draft. Uh, we added a new transform. So the SNS in short for sequence number subspace is SNS transform. Just like uh, encryption or ESN, it's, a, it's another parameter that you use to modify the way you do the crypto. So in that case, you, it, it creates a variance around the entire replay. That transform contains two values. Uh, the first one, the supported inbound subspaces uh, is gonna tell how many inbound subspaces we are able to, to receive and support. And the second value is how many outbound subspaces we want to use. Because from our experience, that's how we want to use the subspaces. It's the sender that knows how many subspaces it wants to use because it knows how many cores it has, how many, um, uh, how many paths, different uplinks and paths it has. So it knows how many subspaces it needs to use. And it's up to the receiver to say, okay, I do support that many subspaces for you or I don't. And with just one RTT, we are able to, to exchange um, uh, and negotiate how many subspaces we want to use. Uh, next slide, please. So the implementation status. Um, so again, we have implemented that in VPP. We are uh, still willing and we want to open sourcing, uh, open source the, the changes we've made, uh, but we still need to clean that up uh, before we can do so. Um, same thing more or less for StrongSwan, but that is new. Uh, so we have made the changes to, to StrongSwan and this is what it looks like in the end. In the same way you specify your ESP proposals, uh, it's a it's a change to the crypto, the way you do crypto. So it's a change to the proposal. And you add the transform as an SNS transform, uh, specifying the two values again, the number of inbound subspaces that you support and the number of outbound subspaces that you do want. Uh, finally, so we have a um, closed source implementation. I'm mentioning that for two reasons. First, just mentioning that we are wanting to deploy that next year. Um, it doesn't mean that we don't want uh, to interoperate with others. It doesn't mean that we don't, I mean, we are really, we really do want this to become a standard. Anyway, it doesn't mean that we are not willing to make changes to that. Uh, it's not because we deploy it that we cannot make, make changes for the, for the standard. And I just wanted to clarify that. Uh, and also, you know, I wanted to, to explain how we do use it and why we end up with so many subspaces. It's mostly happening on TX when we want to transmit an IPsec packet. Um, every core ends up 
needing to send um, packets on a given SA. And let's say we have eight cores, for instance. Then the core wants to transmit on a given uplink. Uh, we might have like three uplinks. Uh, so every core, every uplink needs a different, uh, every combination of those two need a, need a different um, subspace or child SA if you do it with a different child SAs. But as well, if you send to a remote peer which has multiple uplinks and you are an SD1 router just like we are, and you know you monitor the different paths you have, you're trying to take the best out of them, you try to use the best path. So you end up using multiple paths. Um, and so you end up, let's say three uplinks, uh, local uplinks, three remote uplinks, that's nine different paths. And let's say you have eight different cores, that's uh, 72 uh, different subspaces that you need. And at this point, I, I hope that you understand our pain when we realize that we would need 144 Ike messages just to negotiate that many child essays. Uh, and that's why we are continuing to present this draft is because for us, uh, this seems like a no-go. Uh, on the inbound, when we receive the packet, it's actually pretty simple. We just um, load balance the, the packets uh, using the, the subspace to the different cores. Uh, next slide, please, to, to conclude. This is the last uh, slide. Just wanted to clarify two points. Uh, one is regarding the uh, IPRs. So currently, the draft has two disclosed IPRs with you know, what I call good terms, you know, the, the free of use if it becomes a standard. Um, and during the two last ATFs, there has been what I call rumors of another patent. Uh, we, have trying, we have been trying to find it. We have not found it. Uh, you know, and I'm saying that on record. Uh, we have not found this patent. Um, and no one was able to actually point us towards a given uh, that patent. So, you know, just wanted to point out that either you know this patent exists and you are able to provide it, you show it, or, you know, just don't talk about rumors, please. Um, second point was regarding the discussions because, you know, this is the first time we, we present. Uh, initially, it looked like to us there was a, a lot of support. We got, you know, three people, and I, by people, I mean not the authors of the draft, and I mean different companies, obviously. Uh, expressed support for adoption for this draft. Three other people uh, mentioned they were facing similar issues and, and wanted, uh, were having similar challenges. During the first presentation we made, one person was having uh, strong concerns and sa were saying, right, okay, that the other solution was, um, was the, the solution that the working group was pushing. Since then, there hasn't been any, uh, really been any um, uh, objection or there has been a little bit of support, absolutely no objection. And um, so two things may, might be happening right now. Either there is actually a strong support for it, in which case I think it's, it could be good to do an adoption call, or there are actually people who are against it and may have reasonable concerns, but we are not hearing them, in which case I think an adoption call would be a good idea to uh, you know, yeah, have them expose their concerns. Uh, and that's it for me. Thank you. All right. We are quite short on time so be quick yeah super quick uh three people in uh support in like in most other group that means total lack of interest uh like you know in if you go to rats there are 20 people support if you go to OAS, there are 40. three people is like nothing <laughs> <laughs> that okay then. so actually one of the things i have commenting you know creating 144 you know uh, ip uh, ipsec essays should take less than a you know then tenth of the second. What's the problem? I assume the problem is that you don't support uh, Ike version two with its windowing mode. So you are actually doing round trips, uh, 144 round round trips, which is the issue. But if you have a windowing no, mode, no, we, we we could do we, we could send all the messages. Just a lot of messages. We have we don't have one peer. We have thousands of peers like that. Yeah, yeah, but I, I mean, I mean, if you are really really big system, creating that many assays is not the issue. Well, I'm telling you it is. Uh, Paul Vautas. Um, mostly, mostly at the microphone now because in the, in the past I was sort of a little nervous because of the IPR uh, statements with it. And uh, other than that, um, I, I think I kind of flipped around now. We, um, it seems to be like everyone has a patent on this. And so at some point it doesn't really seem to matter anymore. Like I, I don't see a danger anymore for the IETF to continue this work because of patents because like there will be 10 people with patents fi fighting who will be the first one. So I, I, I think at this point, um, the patent issue is sort of no longer a problem for this draft. And, uh, and seeing that many people have implemented this 
secretly over the last 10 years, apparently anyway, we might as well just sort of try and, 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 and standardize it officially. All right. So we will continue that discussion on the list, I guess. Um, to be okay. Please, please, people, if you have technical concerns about this, you know, speak up. Otherwise, it looks to us that you know um, most people think this is a good idea. Maybe it's not. So tell us it's not. All right. So next one is speed mode. Anthony, are you online? I guess you are supposed to be online. Yeah. Hi. Hello. Yes. Can, Go ahead. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So, um, so we, we sent this draft around two weeks ago, and between then and last week, Bob brought up some information which has kind of changed the way draft should, would proceed if there is interest in it. Uh, because um, this is a uh, this is an attempt to we thought like. Linux had this implemented the IPsec beat mode for a long time. A long time, I mean like over 20 years. So we started using it. And there was always a concern like this is not really standardized. So we, everyone knows there are two modes well known, like the IPsec tunnel mode and transport mode. And there was also a third mode for the last 20 years, the beat mode, which has been used by some, some of us. And because the strong swan supported it using an IQ2 um, uh, private notification, it, it all worked within the in the close community. So there was always interest to like, okay, let's write it down and get the um, IQ notifier and get the um, beat mode standardized instead of the expired draft. And then I didn't know this before, but the Bob uh, notified us it's actually standardized in the RFC 7402. Thank you, Tira, for next yes. slide. Uh, and it's part of the appendix B, and it's same as what was um, in the core part is same as what was in the expired draft 10 year, to 15 years ago. So the basic work of the ESP part is done, and but we still need the IC part standardized so that the IC negotiation can use it. And then we can send the actual packets. So that's what here for, we are here for, like to standardize IC part, clarify if there are anything missing from the ESP part, and then combine you can start using it. The next slide. Uh, so I think I covered most of the history here. It is from 2000, uh, 2009, around this ex expired, and 2010 to 2015, the new RFC, which now we know exists, came around and got it sanitized as an appendix. The next slide. And the currently, what? OK, so let's just go back a bit and see what is it actually used for. Currently, it's used for end-to-end -end systems. It can only support um, uh, one address, a source address and destination. So it is a slash 32 for IPv4 and slash 128 for IPv6. So by doing so, like every packet, you save 20 bytes minimum or more than or up to 40 bytes, it depends on the options. And IPv6, you save up to 40 bytes for every packet. It's also used um, in the HIP, which is actually what, where it got standardized right now. And it's also referred in the minimal IPsec RFC 9333. I think that RFC also missed. This is actually standardized somewhere else. So it's been around for a while, and we're using it. Using it. So next slide. And in terms of software support, the um, um, Linux got its initial commits back in 2006, and StrongSwan supported it. Started supporting it using private Ike Notify around the same time. And some people use it without Ike negotiation, just using ESP. And for that, you can use the IP route too, which also had the support from 2006 onwards. Next slide. Um, and so the next step for us is to um, to get the um, Ike V2 notifier, notifier standardized. And one of the things, um, the initial draft, which uh, included was the topics where the mobile use mobile IP use case and the NAT use case, which are, we are not using at the moment. I don't know if anybody else is using it. Should we use it, add this as a part of the standard? Um, I would like some feedback on this. 
next slide and so so now we, we don't know all the people who are using it are there anyone else using this and we are missing features we would break the features if they were, what they're using or are there any issues like we know one issue for example the ipv4 fragment support um, the original draft didn't support um, uh, ipv fragment ipv4 fragments while ipv6 fragments were supported um, our draft is proposing a solution to make make the ipv IPv4 fragments work same as IPv6. Next slide. Oh, that's it. I think that. Yeah, go back. That's it. So that's it. Like, so what's the interest level of interest and what are the use cases? Are we missing something? All right. You want to get questions now? So, Robert? Yeah. Bob Moskowitz, we are, of course, actively using BEAT in um, aviation command and control, where with multiple links simultaneously sending the data over those links to whichever one is active at that time for it to work. So the ability to be able to have a single um, essay, um, a single um, ESP packet, and you may get duplicate copies because both links or all three links may be currently active delivering the data. Uh, it doesn't matter. It basically works, and we can. And so the uh, UA takes off from the airport um, on the Wi-Fi of the airport. The 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 the, uh, the LTE connections there, and we're using that. But finally, also the Wi-Fi drops away and so forth. We don't care. It just works. So to add this to to Ike. To add this to uh, particularly mobile Ike um, would be very valuable um, to the community. We already see the use of this and allow it to grow even more as such. So I strongly recommend that we figure out how to get this to work. And uh, um, Ari Kinnan is probably the only one left of the original team that's around. Um, but I no, I'll see what I can you know, kind of drag up so we can uh, work together and get this done. Thanks, Bob. So, so I understand, like, so you need the uh, multiple link use case, like the way you send out multiple packets, and some packets may be lost, and some you may receive the duplicates. Exactly, uh, and and you don't care. You really don't care that 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 uh, because you you have those links because you don't know the environment you're in, which will work and which don't work. Um, so you bring all those links up because command and control has to work. So, Th thank you. I don't see any other comments. Oh, actually. Yeah, I'm trying to, so server unreachable. For some okay, so Dan, go, go ahead. Uh, so I guess might be- Say your name. Uh, Dan Harkins. So this might be a question for both Bob and Anthony, but uh, uh, Bob says it's it's working today, and Anthony says that it's possible to, to negotiate this with an IP route command. So uh, does this have to be done in Ike? We're doing it with him. So, but is, so it, yeah. So, so it's, so it's yeah, already, there, it's is already there, defined. Is there, is there a compelling? It's already defined. It's already defined for HIP. There is no way of negotiating it in Ike. And uh, there, there's okay. people who are interested in, in okay. you know, using it in Ike also. And actually, the reason why it's not defined as a generic uh, thing is was that uh, in that time of the day there was this identity locator split uh, fight going over in IETF, <laughs> and and caused this to be not be able to be politically able to be published as a generic RFC. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so, um, well, I'm not an implementer anymore, and uh, but with the chair hat on, I think it's a real shame that an ESP mode is going to be uh, defined in some appendix B of some uh, HIP RFC, and <laughs> if people are using it, it should be in its own document, perhaps with the IKV2 uh, um, uh, negotiation, uh, whatever it needed in DAC to, to negotiate it. So, yeah, I'm very much in favor of uh, having it standardized, both the ESP part and the IQV2 part in uh, one or two RFCs, yes. Yeah, this, there are given answers here. I, I think also it would be useful to have a beat mode as a separate RFC, and I think we probably would want to have a separate RFC for IQ version 2 negotiation, and keep the hip negotiation in whatever RFC I, it's already now. It if is. you are, this is like beat this because you're fixing the fragmentation, whatever. Oh, that's true. Yeah. And, yes. and I'm all for that as well. Okay, good. All right, let's continue that on the list, I think, then. Okay, um, thank you. 
Ok. ESP trailer adjustment. Yeah. Um, thank you very much. My name is Wei Pan from Huawei. And uh, this is our um, challenges faced by uh, the format of ESP when we want to uh, improve uh, the performance of uh, ESP uh, IPsec. Next page, please. Um, first, um, there, is, there are already some uh, improvements to uh, improve the IPsec performance, for example, to use the efficient algorithm and uh, um, to implement, uh, uh, to um, do the uh, encryption and the decryption in the hardware. But uh, we found it may be not enough for the high traffic bandwidth scenarios like the data centers, because uh, in these scenarios, the traffic may be uh, TBPS or even higher. So, and, uh, um, what can be considered in these scenarios, for example, in the data centers, there is another uh, security mechanism called MaxSec. And uh, MaxSec is a layer two uh, security protocols, um, but it can reach the line rate. And uh, uh, this is pretty cool because um, why it can do this? Because uh, uh, the MaxSec is totally implemented by the hardware, not only the encryption and decryption operations. So we also uh, consider uh, whether we can implement the whole IPsec by hardware. Next slide, please. Um, but along with the, this idea, we found uh, there may be some challenges for, um, uh, faced by this ESP packet format. Uh, you can see that the, uh, in ESP, the, um, the ESP trailer is at the end of the packet and uh, some important fears are also at the uh, end. Uh, for example, the next header. And this next header is um, uh, is used to decide how to reset the uh, next header related fears in the air two or IP header. And uh, cost of this um, format, when the chip um, process the um, ESP packet, uh, the encrypted ESP packet, uh, it needs to um, catch the data before it can get the uh, next header. And uh, um, but this is a pain point because the chip like like the mode of decrypt and uh, transmit. Um, it means you decrypt how much, how many bits, and then transmit to the next stage, and uh, do not do catch because catching may be uh, expensive, uh, uh, co cost um, uh, causative for the chip. And you need to add uh, to cost the chip areas for uh, implement catching. And, uh, um, and this chip area means more chip area means more energy consumption, which is not eco-friendly. Next slide, please. And uh, also we have two um, uh, possible optimizations. Uh, first, because this super high IPsec performance is only needed at the uh, limited scenarios. So, and these scenarios usually are uh, using uh, ESP terminal mode. So maybe we can only uh, implement the optimization for ESP terminal mode is to uh, judge the type of inner IP header according to its first bit, a byte because the first byte of IPv4 header or IPv6 header indicates the IP version. And uh, this is easy to implement, but um, it, as it said, it only supports the ESP terminal mode and uh, also the dummy packet function may not be supported. Next slide, please. And the next solution may be more, uh, may have more significant changes. It is to uh, move the ESP trailer uh, after the ESP header. And uh, so this kind of new ESP pro protocol can support both uh, transform mode and terminal modes, but uh, yeah, it has more significant changes. Next slide, please. So for our consideration, uh, uh, because we, I'm not familiar with the IPsec history and I don't know if there are any specific uh, reasons of putting uh, ESP trailer at the end of the packet and uh, 
uh, I also want to hear whether this problem was solving and the, uh, whether there is some reasonable solution yet. Thank you. All right, we are quite out of time, so yes. very quick. Okay, uh, you suggested that uh, what I heard was you're thinking about transporting the, the decrypted packet before the authentication check. That is a really, really bad idea with GCM. Uh, don't do that. Uh, in addition, uh, if you're worried about transport, if you're using transport mode, you're not going to use these, you're not going to be running at these, these gigabyte uh, uh, per second rate. So that's, uh, to me, a lesser concern. Thank you. Um, I mean, uh, let me explain a little. Uh, I didn't mean transmit the packet uh, uh, immediately out of the chip, just uh, to the next stage of the chip. Yeah. Hi, Hannes. Uh, if you go back uh, one slide, I think it is mm -hmm. not one more. One more. Um, is there some more detailed analysis? Uh, I'm, I'm, in, I'm particularly interested in the problem statement uh, on uh, on the exact performance issue because it's a very generic. The chip must like what type of chip are we talking about here? Like these packets are not tremendously large they have let's say if they have authenticated encryption with additional data you you need to put the tag at the end of the packet uh, which would be um which you you need to have that packet in memory anyway like how long are the packets like what type of size are we talking about when you say more chip area is needed uh, to implement this caching it's not really caching in the in the sense of what chips do it's like you need to to process this, like, are we talking about an off-the-shelf chip, uh, or are we talking about an ASIC or FPGA, or what, what, what are we talking about? Uh -huh. um, for now, um, I, I may can't answer this clearly, but uh, uh, for our scenarios, these are the um, how do you say the MP, the network processor, and uh, so ASIC mostly. Uh, maybe, yeah. I, I need to check it back, mm -hmm. um, and uh, yeah. yeah, because. Um, yeah, we, I, I'm just trying to better understand the, yeah, the yeah, problem. Yeah, yeah, We can, we can, um, to you know, analyze more and make this more specific. Yeah. 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 Cool. Daniel, really short. <laughs> yeah, pretty short. I, I'm wondering if if anyone has a, the the historical reason why we put that at the end. Yeah. So maybe that would be clarifying yes, also. Yes. Yeah, so just, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just recalling that. Just recalling that. Okay, Bob Buckingham. Back, back when I was a chair, uh, <laughs> co-chair on this, um, and, and, and I was thinking, yes, we put it specifically at the end. I remember this discussion so that you were finished processing the packet, and then you got the next header to know what followed. So you didn't have to hold the next header while you're processing the first data. So there was a there was an absolute decision and debate at that time that next header had to go at the end. I remember that debate. <laughs> oh, yeah, you were there. All right. So, and then there is uh, Valerie. Uh, I would just mention that you don't need to move all the trailer into the first place because you only need uh, the next header. And if you want to move for the other part of the trailer, means padding, then you lose the properties. Padding is for the very good reason at the end. It pads the... Um, the length of the encrypted part of the ESP packet up to the requirements that may be imposed by encryption algorithm. For example, CBC uh, needs to be, uh, for CBC you need to be data aligned with a uh, block of uh, uh, used cipher. And uh, there is no such requirements currently for GSM, for example, but generally they can arise later. So you don't you, 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 in your proposal. If you need, if you move all the trailer, you will lose this um, this ability to for data to be aligned. So you need to reconsider your um, uh, proposal for this. Reason. Okay, thank you very much. All right, so that's about that. Then the next presentation is Paul, I guess. Yes. Okay, this is an attempt to, to get the um, smallest, most quick 
document from draft to RFC, next next ITF. Um, so uh, there's, a, there's a demand from our customers that um, when a tunnel goes down, they don't really know why the tunnel goes down. They don't know whether they need to flag an instant or whether the machine is just going to get rebooted or whether there's a simple restart or a software update. And they kind of want to know that, um, can we send a signal with the delete tunnel uh, command so that um, the, the other end can be informed of why the tunnel goes down. So I put up a proposal. I figured maybe it's useful to have a two byte counter for the number of seconds that the um, that there might be downtime. So if you're rebooting your machine, you could put in a value of, I don't know, 60 seconds. Um, and then you could put a, a recent message in there. Initially, I thought of a free form message, but then I realized it might be useful to actually have maybe a sub registry um, with an enum so that we actually all use the same reasons. Uh, for ease of implementation. Next slide. Um, so my, one question is, is the two uh, octet seconds useful or is it over engineering? Uh, and then um, maybe we can do an enum and maybe a, 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 an open string where we can put custom things in. So internally, you could even have something like um, Paul Wouters rebooted this host uh, for you know uh, reasons of like his power, his power is going to go out in five minutes. Um, and that's it. So here are a few reasons that we figured out that were useful to actually say why we're deleting it. And in fact, the um, the most interesting reasons were actually uh, um, I came up with uh, after talking to Anthony. It's we have these cases where we have a simultaneous rekey or we have an initial co contact message um, or, a, or an IQ authentication uh, or a redirection accepted where we actually um, we very well know the reason why we're doing things, but we're not we're not relaying that information down to the peer and. Um, this is just a way of getting that information to the peer so that we all know what's going on. Um, is there interest in this? Um, should I work on this? And very, very short. <laughs> this brings to mind a debate we had very recently in aviation, just last, uh, six months ago, maybe a little bit there, that for when you have an emergency, do you put a reason for the emergency of why your UA is crashing? And, and, and basically came out a decision, you cannot define a list of such things. If you're gonna do it, we do have an information field, just put text in there. And, and don't try to at all ever to enumerate it because you never get done enumerating them. But, yeah, but, okay, so, so, so one issue is that if you enumerate it, you could maybe have automated actions based on that. If it's pure text flow, you can never be sure that, you know, Cisco and Libreswan will implement the same text oh, oh, Okay, I'm just giving you an example where we had an actual case right. where we said, no, don't do it. Yeah, so let's, so, let's move the discussion yeah, yeah. in, the, okay. in the mailing list. Uh, you can just so, kind of go. I'm just going to say, uh, uh, just Texas doesn't work for us because we're on, we may are generally uh, automated, so there's no nothing we can do with text. Yeah, all right. And of course, you always have to think about what the other end does when it gets that. All right, so then did we come to the last presentation? This one. Yep. Okay. Uh, let's see. Uh, uh, let's see. The young figure from Grumanton Laboratory. Okay. Closer. Okay. Move it up. Then. Okay. Uh, let's see. The young figure from Grumanton Laboratory. I will show you the updates of uh, I I survey. Uh, and it changes to edit set. Next page, please. Uh, so uh, RSAV is uh, the uh, ARM approach for inter-IS source address relation with RPK and IPsec. Here I will I will only show the changes to IPsec. <coughs> RSAV, uh, it uses I IKE to establish the connections uh, with each other uh, to uh, synchro uh, synchronize the security <laughs> association. And uh, it will uh, encrypt, uh, encapsulate the traffic uh, with IPsec authentic shader or ESP in data plane. And next page, please. Uh, so the changes to IPsec it shows uh, <coughs> here. In transport, in transport mode, we would like to uh, use authentic shader. It splits the uh, reserved field to two parts. One is uh, reserved and the other is scope. Uh, when scope uh, the value is zero, it stands for IPsec. Uh, when it is one, it, is, uh, it means for 
the RISV. <coughs> the trend is to IKE is, uh, uh, it should uh, index by uh, SPI and the uh, counterpart as AS number to find the uh, security association in SDA database. And in tunnel mode, uh, it, uh, uh, so why we should use the AS number here? It, uh, it is because we just want to uh, protect the IP prefix, not the single IP. In tunnel mode, we'd like to use ESP. Uh, it supports both ESP encryption and uh, uh, now encryption. And the tunnel is built uh, with in current AS border router and uh, ACS uh, AS control server introduced in RTK. Uh, and the IKE, uh, the changes for IKE is the same as in transport mode. Uh, to elevate the uh, pressure on the tunnel, we'd like to uh, implement transport mode as the default. Uh, next page, please. So the changes are acceptable. Uh, by the way, uh, we want to explain, uh, sorry, I want to implement uh, RISV with VPP and uh, Strong's one. Hope we can achieve it before uh, ITF 119. Suggestions and uh, comments are welcome. Thanks. All right. So I think we are, we have a couple of minutes, but I think, uh, is there any comments on this? Or is there any comments on actually the, you know, other points of interest? Okay, so I think there's no comments on this. Thanks. Okay, thank you. So, does anybody have any, have any other issues that they would bring, want to bring up? I have to say that I have been, you know, the uh, mailing list has been very quiet. For example, the, the one working group last call has had the GRO, you know, comments. <laughs> and, and I mean, the drafts don't go forward. <laughs> The chairs don't don't push the chairs the drafts out. The authors also have to do you know do their work, and people actually have to review the drafts. <laughs> like <clears throat> Hannes was saying, three people is not enough. I think IP is quite often it has been because there is about three implementations, and the three three people who are <laughs> implementing are the ones that are really matter. <laughs> hmm? No, it's not a quality, but, it, but it, 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 it's, it's the one that it, it, they represent the three implementations that are the, you know, the mainstream. All right, but if there is nothing else, I think that we can finish this one. All right, do you have, do you have any comments on there? Just say hi. All right, all right. That's it. That's it.